All right, welcome back everybody. Welcome back for the last talk already. And we end with another keynote. We have Kevin McPeak, who has been working in telecommunications and IT security since, well, way back when the internet was born or the World Wide Web was, was born. And he's going to talk to us about the tale of two telcos. So I'm really curious. Uh, Kevin, the floor is yours. <coughs> Excuse me, thanks. This is the, um, I will give a little confession, just a bit of a background. I was actually working on this PowerPoint presentation to about four in the morning. Uh, but it is a presentation I've actually given about 50, 60 times before over the last, say, 10 to 12 years. Uh, mostly internally, mostly in closed door sessions. Um, and I'm really excited because even though this is an issue that concerns us all, I'm really glad I can finally bring this message to you because it is something I think is going to help us all if we can solve this issue. Um, this is actually the sanitized version, not the one that some people wanted to hear. And I'm, I'm afraid I have to do that for understandable reasons regarding D, uh, NDAs and confidentiality agreements. And on the flip side, I still have very much a professional relationship with my former employer. And, and it's a relationship I very much want to keep and their interest and remaining secure are still very much my own. So, who am I? Uh, a lot of people, actually I just had somebody I was uh, speaking to who I knew well, but he looked at me and he said, I didn't know anything about you. So I thought, let's go ahead and do a quick introduction because I can imagine there's not too many foreigners working in the telecommunications security business here. And I know a few people were like, I've always seen you, but I, I never really knew what you were doing or where you were from. Um, there is a myth going around that I'm from Texas. I grew up in Texas. I, I'm not really from there. I was born in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we moved there when I was about six years old to Texas, and I spent the rest of my life before I moved to the Netherlands, pretty much there. I consider Roman my Dutch birthplace, if you will, because uh, that's really where I got my start here in the Netherlands. Uh, but my heart and home is in The Hague. I really love the city, and I'm really active in the community from everything from the, the excuse me if I get this wrong, the Buurt Provincie. <laughs> to, to, to actually photographic projects that I'm just engaging the community with for free and just out of my own passion. A lot of my friends say I'm very Dutch after 20 years, but I just still don't speak it very much, and I apologize for that. Um, this has been the downright most impressionable experience I've had living and working in the telecommunications sector in a foreign country and one that I love very much. I've been very busy, <laughs> as you might can expect. Uh, just a quick highlight of I, I was a typical nerd from the 80s, computer geek. My father was a very senior person at Motorola. He's also an electrical engineer and I had a stepfather who was a general in the Air Force who was an architectural engineer as well. So both my, my fathers had dual hats. I grew up with two fathers who had dual hats. You can imagine, well, as my wife likes to say, I have enough hobbies to kill a horse with. And <laughs> uh, I am a doer. I don't know everything. I never profess that I know everything. I am still learning. And pretty much most of what I'm going to talk to you about tonight, I don't know a lot about. But I figure I know enough, and I've been talking with enough people and people are telling me, we're, this is the right track. So I thought, let's bring it to you. And my purpose of this is to try to discuss, start a discussion, not between ourselves, but with executives of corporations or government leaders here in, in the Netherlands or in the European Union, because this also affects, although my context, I have drawn the, uh, for purpose of the discussion, a little bit against the background of where I used to work uh, you'll see how I've done that in a minute, but, but these are problems that are actually affecting us at all, in all domains, not just computer security. I take a, a hacker approach to pretty much everything. I've just been through a few pictures. I've, got, I've been in the media a lot lately with my photography project called Hogs of Feet Chic, or now just called Feet Chic because I've expanded it to, um, to other cities in the Netherlands, and I'm taking pictures of cyclists, very artistic portrait pictures. But even that project was started with a very hacker type mentality. Start every single day and just keep chipping at it until somebody actually notices. 
and above all, try to be benevolent and respectful. I've also uh, breed corals. If you've ever been to Blydorp Zoo in Rotterdam, you've probably so seen some of the corals I, I grew in my living room. Um, but the real reason I'm here is I started working in mobile security in 2001. Uh, I saw some colleagues from Risk Secure. Uh, it was your, your founders that actually hired me in this industry, Harko Robach and Mark Fiddeman. And I have to say, my, my, my hat's off to them because they really kind of gave me a kickstart in this industry because when I came here, I was already working in security, but I'd never worked in such a large company before. And, and I really appreciated a lot of their guidance in those early days. I uh, worked on the front line. When I actually joined the telco industry, I made a decision. I didn't want to chase management or become a careerist. I decided to stay on the front line. I'd already had my own company called Trust Factory. That had, we were specialized in instant management uh, type of activities and also getting into intrusion detection at the time. And I really enjoyed working on the front line. So I decided to stay there. And, and, and eventually over time, at the first company, um, we achieved quite, a, quite an achievement when our third party vendor came back to us and said, you're not only our quietest commercial company that we monitor, or quietest commercial organization, um, you're a telco. And of course I looked at that and I was like, we're not detecting anything. Let's start over. And we, for the next year we went and actually checked out and sure enough, we ended up having a very secure network. More so, at least, I hate to use that term, we all do, I think, uh, it was the risk were manageable, extremely manageable, and it went from a situation of extreme crisis to extreme manageability in only about five years. And so I want to talk to you how we did that. Um, one thing I did is I hacked the organizational structure of not one, but two telcos. I literally flipped where security was inside the company, and I'm going to tell you why I did that today. But first, I want to know from you, can I get a show of hands from you guys, because this, is, this will help me cater my presentation a little bit. I really want you to be honest, but I'd really like to know, and don't worry, I'm not going to judge you, and I don't want anyone else to, but if you, have a, if you are honest with yourself and honest with me, and you were to, to say, hmm, everyone who's not security in the company organization I'm working at, and evaluate their perspective of what you are doing, can I get a show of hands? How many think that your non-security colleagues are doing something like this? So is everyone, non-security people are all saying, you're more like this security guy? You're very friendly, you never come around, kick anyone's asses, fire anybody. You guys don't have problems like that? You don't have problems with accountability, visibility, transparency? Sorry? Well, uh, I'm sorry, have you seen The Big Lebowski? Okay, I'm sorry, I maybe made a bit of an assumption here. Sam Elliott here plays a very gentle character, but he plays a very morally, more of a morally righteous one. But he's, he's more like your grandfather telling you when you've done something stupid. He doesn't scold you, but just through explaining it by logic, you walk away feeling really dumb. <laughs> Which is a whole different world from these guys. You do something, they're going to tase your ass. And if you resist the tasing, they're going to haul you down to jail. Uh, too often, one thing over I've seen, and it's not just my former employers I'm referring to, one thing that the telco communications industry, in terms of my job in security, did for me, it gave me a huge insight into a lot of business operations of other companies. I'm not here to talk about those companies per se, but the things I saw going on, how they approached security, and also noticing sometimes maybe there was a parallel in my company, but maybe there wasn't, but I noticed this is going in all these other companies, companies we're partnering with. And when I started discussing this in closed door forums about what were the greatest threats against an organization and somebody had talked about supply chain management as a risk that's not being identified, and I started raising some of these issues, I did get some attention. But I'm, of course, I'm just a little bit curious, is there nobody's willing to raise their hand that you perhaps maybe have a perspective problem 
from your colleagues that you might be coming across like this. Because I'll be honest with you, I worked for a secu security team at one point in my history that was very much like this. And I was one of those people. So if you don't want to raise your hand, I understand, but I know that there are other people out there, so I'm going to continue on this. The difference between these is, is what we're seeing, the culture that this breeds, a technology-centric culture in evaluating risk is a very reactive one. And now I think a lot of us probably know this. A lot of us as security professionals are probably out there raising risk to senior management or trying to raise it to senior management and the message isn't getting through. Or if it gets through, you look at their, their evaluation of it and think, are they not understanding the scope? However, if you actually have a very business-centric risk evaluation process that is looking holistically at all the risk, if you're building an e-commerce system and you're building that e-commerce system, it's not looking at, hey, this is just the threats to Apache or this is just the threats to, to some sort of JavaScript thing they're going to run on the client side. But the, if you have a holistic risk process, they're going to look at that not as a silo in of itself. And they're going to end up saying, hey, where are we hosting this on? Virtual machines, okay, that's fine. What else is on those virtual machine hosts? Oh, the SAP finance system. Maybe not such a good idea for an e-commerce system. But when you would tackle that from a business side centric of evaluating risk, all of these issues should be getting addressed in the beginning. When you do it technology side, by the time you've already got the plans in your hand of what's got to be deployed and you're looking at and trying to understand where's the security requirement list? Uh, five points, really? This is all we got? Now we gotta go fix it. I gotta raise this, we have an issue with a CTO. We have these problems keep plaguing our industry. I've been going to DEF CON, I've been going to Hack in the Box, uh, every hack in the box in Amsterdam since they started, I've been going to it as a volunteer. And I keep hearing the same thing both from conference attendees and other volunteers. In fact, some of the people, not just at hack in the box, but sometimes actually some other conferences, hack in the box actually has a really cool positive culture. Uh, but, but and, and this is, by the way, my first time ever here, so I can't speak of this one, but it seems pretty cool. Uh, but some other conferences, and they were actually conferences in the state I've been to. And the volunteers showing up, completely stressed out. Nice people, good people. And they're attacking other volunteers at these conferences. Personal attacks. And you're thinking, you were friends last year, what the hell happened? And you realize, this is, this is stress. This person is internally conflicted. Has nothing to do with the conference, has nothing to do with the friend. These things I kept sitting in the back of my mind. Why does this continue to happen? We have all sorts of these problems that continue to happen. We have bad actors in our security. You can turn on the news. You'll see every now and then some security professional was fired for something he wasn't supposed to have done. We have companies that can never seem to get a hold of the loop. And I, I, I won't, again, won't call these out. You can just simply Google these in the press. But there's been several, art, several companies out of my my country, what well, I call Holland also my country, but America, big major retails, retailers that continued to take a series of hits, one after the other, and yet you could watch what was happening. And people scratching their heads all around going, well, why can't they get ahead of this? When I look at all these, these the, the same complaints coming from a lot of the same people, and I started trying to enumerate what were the common roots, and trying to track a lot of this back, what is causing this problem? And, and we all, a lot of us have a pretty good idea, but none of us had really tried to put this down on pen and paper that I've seen. There are, there are some places you can find this, and I am going to come back to that in a minute. But I'm, I've been quite astonished, especially these last five years, how many management types aren't seeing the whole picture, especially in regards to the controls they're talking about. And the one thing that I started looking at when I saw this several years ago, with similar things, similar activities that we see also in our financial world. And it's an issue known as a moral hazard. Does anyone know what a moral hazard is? You know what a conflict of interest is? So basically we have this 
And in fact, I just got done speaking 30 minutes ago to somebody else who said he has that problem going on nonstop. People are taking risk decisions that they don't bear the consequences of their risk for. Technology directors taking, why? Because their incentives aren't actually aligned with risk management. Their incentives are for something else. Let's take, for example, a cloud ser service vendor. You look at, and let's look at their organizational structure, just like you would look at a computer if you're doing forensics and you want to know what happened in those final five minutes before something bad happened. You go back and you look at the structure of the processes. What were those processes doing? Where were those, where were those processes being initiated from? And when I started doing this against companies, which is just a large collection of systems and processes, but of a human kind, an analog kind, uh, I, I kept coming up and seeing this. IT security is a function of the technology department. Not always, but sometimes. And in year 2000, when I did my first hacker conference talk, DEF CON 8, we revealed some vulnerabilities in Lotus Notes. Prior to that conference talk, when we were trying to do the responsible disclosure and get them to talk to us about this and fix the vulnerabilities, I was really surprised that all the technical risk people were working in product marketing. Not technology, not risk, product marketing. Now, if you remember Lotus Notes back around 2000, they pretty much only had one core product by that time. Lotus Notes, and we, we went to DEF CON with six different vulnerabilities that basically just ripped it to shreds. And the whole time, we're sitting there talking with a guy who's frustrated in product marketing, but he, he doesn't have the remit over marketing's goals, their incentives. He was a slave to them. He was conflicted. We ended up doing our presentation, but we actually were trying to do something slightly different. CFO is the head of finance. Risk management typically, not always, but typically is a function of finance. Why? I'll get to that in a second, if you don't already know. When you look at this, this is, when you put IT security as a, a function of technology, Service delivery becomes its priority. Oh, sorry, remote of risk management. Sorry about that. <laughs> that was supposed to be a function of, of, of risk management. Um, but and this is another example. We've all seen this. A CEO goes off and decides, or somebody, maybe marketing, decides that there's a new campaign with a new business partner, and we need to share a whole bunch of customer data with them real fast. And it's already been decided. The strategy had already been going on for 16 weeks. You knew nothing about it. Now we got three weeks to implement this stupid stuff. Involves massive amounts of sharing data. And you're looking at the privacy legislation going <gasps> and, and so then you decide to do the right thing. You go back to your management or maybe the CTO if you have a flat organization and say, this is bad. We got privacy issues. You're wanting to locate an e-commerce system on virtual machines with hosts of internal company confidential data and, and, and our colleagues' data. This is a really bad idea. Who knows what's going to happen? Does anyone, just shout it out. Sorry, what will happen? Sorry? It's coming from the, yes, yes, CEO. Yes, but what are the famous lads' words? We all know them. We'll fix it in production. I have seen two decades of this, on and off. And I, this is what I'm presenting, is to how do you fix this? I've seen it in my company and I've seen it in others. Even after we fixed it in our company, we still had in others. So who's really running risk management at this point? You have a company, whether it's, it's any IT company, and in fact, this isn't limited to IT companies anymore. The modern company actually has so much infrastructure, so much internet connectivity. More and more companies are adopting internet of, uh, internet of things, 
new protocols, some of the old vulnerabilities are being reinvented all over again. And all of this is a must do. We have to be first, we have to achieve our incentives and everything else. So who ends up doing really true risk management? And, 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 and sorry for the nerd collective that is just the loose collection of skilled technical people who kind of have a clue, but they're not really empowered to be doing this job, but they'll try it anyway because they know it's the right thing to do. Or at least to try to do as much as they can. Does anyone know Stephen Wright? She used to be one of my funniest, well, favorite quotes from him. I'd kill for a Nobel Peace Prize. But we're doing the same thing, and it's no joke. It's got to get breached first before we'll get the budget to secure it. I have heard this so many times, both internal sometimes on my team and in other companies, going and saying, hey, we, need, we have a requirement, this gets fixed. We have no budget for that, sorry. Do you want to pay us to do it? It happens. So other companies are suffering, and this ca causes knock-on effects. I have a, a strong feeling about this. I know people in this industry who are friends of mine, and I don't want to diss them, but I know that they take this attitude, and I'm really concerned that they are putting themselves at personal liability. And, and yeah, it's that this is even happening is just wrong. But this creates another effect I've seen. I did see it in one of my two telcos. I won't mention which one. And I did see it in other companies. When you start getting hidden risk, realize, or I'm sorry, when you start getting, yeah, hidden risk is a dramatic consequence. Everyone starts to freak out and lose their cool. And in fact, I've seen directors, CTOs, who sat there and looked at me in the face and go, we understand everything that's going on in this company. You, you underestimate our knowledge. And then the next week, look at me and go, how the fuck was this possible? Guess what happens? Typically, as a function of IT security, they start engaging, and it's not intentional. We're human beings. We do this. I do it. I've done it. I'm not proud to admit it, but I've tried to learn to stop making these mistakes. We try to cover our ass. We say, oh, we're understaffed. We got 20 people, 1,000 employees. That's not enough security people. We can't fix everything. So budgets get ramped up, then another hit comes along six weeks later. And this actually happened. This was all over in the news. I'll, I'll let you do your research and figure out who I'll give you a hint. It was in America. Another hit happens just a few weeks later. Budgets are really taking off now. And that whole corporate communications is really working overtime. You know, it's all okay. It's all okay. Everything's all right. It's all right. Director starts issuing edicts. Don't worry. I'm telling the public, it's all okay. Boom. By this time, a couple of things happen potentially happen. Budgets increase further. They really start to take off at this point. IT security, and I've seen this too. <sighs> this has to stop. Reshuffling IT security departments around and around over a period of a decade, just three, four times in a decade, isn't, isn't doing your company any good. I've seen companies put IT security in facility, try that for a couple of years. Oh, that didn't work, so let's put IT security over in technology again. Well, that didn't work, so let's put them over on the CEO's office, which by this way, sometimes that works. If you have a CEO who has an internal audit responsibility, that can work. I wouldn't consider it optimal, but it can work. But I've other the cases I've seen weren't that. We put IT security right off the CEO's office. The problems that you get there is, your CEO doesn't have time, typically, to, to, to learn all the technology. He doesn't have time for you to try to figure out how to translate it. It's not his job. And quite often, he's not there. He's busy leading the company's strategy. Where this really needs to go, 
is someplace completely different. This effect I described, the hyper-acceleration of budgets and growth, by the way, that don't confuse that with normal measured response. A normal measured response, you're still going to increase budgets and you're still going to try to get some additional resources, but they should be measured in proportion to the threats you need to manage. Not crazy, grab at the sky, grab as many resources, grab as much budget we can get our hands on. And I've seen that approach and it's one day it's going to come back, if that's your approach as a director, it will come back to haunt you. I've seen it. Because somebody's going to say, you know that 20 million we gave you? Where'd it go? Where'd the ri why, why aren't we managing risk yet? But that you get this when you manage it as a technology problem. And, and when I first really keyed on to this was back before I even started in telco. I'd started a company here in The Hague, or over in The Hague, uh, here in the Netherlands, called Trust Factory. It was my first attempt to try to take my security skills full-time, 24-7, in my own capacity, uh, rather than working for a company that would let me do security half the time. I really wanted to do this. I wanted to do penetration testing and instant response. And I got over there, and, and most of the pen, pen test is how I would typically approach a company, and I'd go to talk to the CTO, and he'd sit there and he'd milk me, and I'd talk to a few CTOs at even large banks that you, you would know. I would sit there and I would try to explain to them where, where they've got risk exposure. They'd sure like knowing everything I told them. They didn't want me to talk to them again. They didn't want to call me anymore. I was, and it wasn't until I talked to a friend of mine, guy I had previously presented with, or later would present with him, he says, you've got, you're telling him he's got problems, he hates you the second you do that. You're an outsider, you come in and you say, hey, your, your, your ship's about to sink. He's like, I just told my CEO, everything's green. Now you're telling me I've got problems, you're a problem. And I learned not to do that, real fast. Once I started going to the CFO, or whoever is responsible for risk management, they were always interested to talk to me. This is, I sum it up with one sentence, and I've said this for more than 15 years. Technology exists to preserve shareholder value. We're not there to protect electronic bits. That's the method, but that's not our end goal. We're there to protect shareholder value. And as a company, as long as you don't violate the law and you make sure that your company doesn't just full of full chalk of moral hazards and conflicts of interest, it should actually kind of work itself out. The free market is unencumbered because I sure as hell don't want to use any telco vendor that I think is insecure. But this is something we have to go back to as security professionals. We all know it about developing programs. We know about developing architectures. But with regards to our own management, why aren't we asking this question more? Why aren't we asking these questions more? I'll give you another helpful idea about how this is working in the real world. What if your left hand was actually taking decisions for itself? Not all the time, half the time, 50%. Your mind still had control of your hand the other 50% of the time. But your mind doesn't know your hand is taking its own risk decisions. In fact, it seems sort of strange. I go to do a chin-up, and I fall down and land on my ass. Why is this happening? I don't know, but just keep doing it. The risk, the risk methodology is separate from the brain and the hand. This goes on for a few years. Your brain doesn't know what's happening. By the time you're 30 years old, what do you think your body is going to look like? It's probably not going to look as good as it looks right now. The structure of our brain matters to the processing of sensory input and risk. And in fact, this actually, the picture is actually a very new development that they've just figured out about sensory deprivation syndrome. Some people that have problems actually realizing their senses. They don't feel pain, they don't feel touch. And they realized it's the structure of the brain. Same thing for our companies. It's the hardware, stupid. And, and it's, again, it's not CTO. Sorry if you're a CTO and I sound like I'm picking on you, I'm not. I'm saying this as your friend. If you're a CISO reporting to a CIO, you've probably got the same problem. 
I never had that construction, but I know half a dozen people who do, and they've told me it's bloody awful in terms of risk management. And internal audit hanging off risk management is also not smart. That itself is a conflict of interest. This is the one nobody likes to talk about. Because almost every telco, not just here in the Netherlands, but around the world, does this. And it's, and it's as best as I can tell, at least in many places of the world, it is an option of convenience. And everyone goes, oh yeah, but you have security, you have facilities, it's economical to put it there. No, it's not. Systemic risk does not bring efficiency. We'll get to that in a minute. But if you have hidden risk in your structure, you're never going to get it out of the processes, never going to get it out of your systems. You might be able to patch or work around it, but it is always going to cost you money. It's not just about security. It is about money. It is the driver of risk management. It is the driver of business. Business is a risk decision. Say this about lawful interception. The risk of abuse increases with the ethically conflicted team or individual of an investigative oversight, monitor, or audit role. Why? Because they want to get their job done. They have incentives to conduct an investigation, sometimes, in my opinion, too fast. They just want a name. They just want to stop the problem. They want to stop the hurt. And sometimes people think they need to know who it is. And I've talked to people in the industry, people that in other telcos around the world, and, and including also here in the Netherlands. This is actually a problem. In fact, I know other C uh, sorry, chief security officers who tell me this is a problem. And when some of my friends started telling me about this, I just the stories I heard was just unbelievable. But then I thought, this is the same freaking problem. It makes sense. Why have we, none of us, seen this before? And a lot, if you don't know, a lot of lawful, it's not always the same in every country, but a lot of lawful intercept business units get a dedicated stream of money, million euros, two million dollars, three million dollars, depends on how much they're having to do and what's been arranged, and they deliver a promise to deliver a certain level of service delivery to the government, who is a customer. So the natural tendency for a lot of businesses is to stick that in security because they should be secure, right? And hey, let's give security a little bit of extra budget. But that service starts competing against the risk management processes when those two are conflicted and you end up with systemic risk. And I've seen it, I've, I've seen that, that one thing on the lawful interception, the, the, the conflict in regards to priorities. Come to the end of the year, we have to make sure we have certain performance, certain level of performance by the end of the year. So everything gets thrown at lawful interception. Oh, but we suffered a security breach. We'll get back to that after we finish with lawful interception. Why? Because we get in revenue. And if we don't meet our performance agreements, we don't get in revenue. And you have to stop and think there. At first, that idea of a, of a siloed revenue stream for security sounds really attractive. But already, for the entire company, it's just corrupted its risk management process using money. It's something I think we need to address because if, this is, if I've seen this, I can imagine where maybe things are less tightly controlled, it's probably even worse. Oh, this one is a fun one. But we have IT governance, ISO, blah, blah, blah. Having a one-trick pony doesn't make you a cowboy either. Coming from Texas, I happen to know something a little bit about riding a horse. Governance, in my opinion, governance is a lot more about the criteria than the journey. If when you look up the, the when I did a, a dive into governance, the things that I were saying 
reach for this, reach for this. Doesn't say, don't stand on your colleague's head while you're trying to reach for this. Doesn't say anything like that. So what I see often happening was people just going, we have to reach for this, we have a short timeline. What's wrong with stepping on other people's heads to do get there? Governance doesn't tell us we can't do it. It must be okay. In reality, it actually tells us about the conflict of risk. So when I see an IT CTO, somebody else saying, we have IT governance, I'm like, really? Because when I read this, they're talking about all the risk should be owned by the whole business. By the way, who owns IT governance? Is that IT or the business? Oh, you've documented your moral hazard in your ISO documentation. Doesn't that mean you should probably do something about it now? I weak in management. This is one of the, sorry, this, 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 this one just really angers me. Because I've, I've seen, I can't get into the details, it was long ago, but I watched 20 men conflicted for two hours after an incident happened, trying to say, you did this. It was because you were morally conflicted. We're just looking for your help. No. It's cover your ass mentality. 20 guys, all in one room. You can't control that. You can't control that conflict of risk. And, and a big reason why is because you're invested as an employee of the company, typically. Humans are fallible, that includes me and you, and to, 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 to be able to manage it, you've either got to have real life experiences, and probably more than one, or some pretty extreme training, and I'm talking serious military training. And even then, I've seen, my father was a general in the Air Force, he happened to be one of the youngest generals in the Air Force. I also know, remember growing up, and some of the problems he would have to deal with was some of the ethics of people he would have to deal with. And I, no, military's not immune from it either. And you don't have to have a father. You just turn on the news and you see stories. The conflict of incentives are always going to destroy your, your vision, especially when you have a remit for security and a remit for service delivery and your incentive, financial incentive, your performance target for service delivery is far more than for risk management. Maybe risk management doesn't even have any at all, and I've seen that. I see that more often than not, especially when it's working in technology. Do you want to know, do we suffer from this? These aren't signs that you do suffer, but these are some of the signs. I've seen security teams and other companies that have gone off and spent millions and millions of euros that were smaller than us and weren't telcos, and I've scratched my head going, where are they throwing their money? We needed to get this project online. They were supposed to fix this three months ago. Still not fixed. And I knew they had gotten the budget to fix it, and I still couldn't get it fixed. And from their side, what they were doing is realizing the consequences of hidden risk in their project. The problem I mentioned earlier, conference, volunteers that were working in security industry that were very conflicted when they'd show up at conferences. That doesn't just happen at conferences. That happens internally on the teams. And some of the reports, some of the stories I've heard about or have seen, I've seen the full-blown Lucifer effect going in on that team because the team is morally ambiguous. It doesn't have any clear goal of what it's actually supposed to be doing. It's actually internally conflicted with the functions of risk management and the functions of service delivery. And any time one of those two remits aren't met, they get bitch slapped by their management. And they're thinking, how am I supposed to balance this? You can't serve two masters. We all have heard that story as a child. I haven't really seen presidents die, but I have seen personal death in this role. And I've seen professional career death. I've seen it even from directors of the company. And I want to stop it because these are good people that this is happening to. So at some point, 
this, I actually have some authorization clearance to share. A little bit more details on this. Um, in 2004, after realizing this, we were, Dutch Tone had just rebranded to Orange. A decision, instant happened. The consequences weren't realized, but a really bad risk decision, a moral hazard-based one, occurred. And I decided to do something about it. And you can too. You can't implement security from the bottom up, although some people will argue, and once I used to argue that you could, but you can't. But you can kickstart it from the bottom, I found out, and I've done it twice. And the way I did that, and neither case was exactly similar. Oh yeah, if you do this, I don't, adv I don't advise, I'm not telling anyone to go do it, but if you feel that the, the need is such that you need to do it, this is not a guide, it is sort of just a, this is what worked for me. Take it, your mileage will marry, vary, take what will work for you. Don't blame me if it goes south, because there are dragons here, and I'll explain. So how did I accomplish this? It's very simple, and again, it was a hacker mentality. I went brute, brute force, I used asymmetric tactics, I even used the silos of our company to find shelter. Developed a strategy to create awareness and take it forward. And a platform of approach, which really this one was kind of tricky to do. And, um, and I methodically went through all, the whole company, except for where I met resistance. There I would tend to back off. And, and when I met resistance up my management chain, I actually went laterally across the organization. I went to people who had some either awareness or investment. They were invested in actually seeing this fixed. And when I explained it to them, and this is where I started making this presentation again and again and again, usually in the space of about five minutes and all, only on a whiteboard. Uh, they would sit there and they would look at me and quite often the, the response I'd get was a jaw hitting the desk going, how, how, how did this get implemented? Legal and regulatory look like they'd seen a ghost. Things that can also help. Things I think can also help. If you're not, if you're a hothead, if you've gotten past warnings for maybe unethical things you've bent the rules on, don't try this. It's not going to work. You, if you haven't been working on making sure of being sound character in your actions on the job and people do not believe you're of sound character, I could expect this would go bad, really bad. But be patient, be determined, and when you meet people that are giving you resistance, try to find new ways to love them. Don't hate them. Because we're in this position, we're in this role, or at least many of us should be, should be here to trying to protect these people, protecting our customers and protecting our organizations. So when you meet resistance, you should first evaluate if you want to continue because it gets really daring from here. Um, it, and I recognize not everyone is going to want to do this. I wasn't out to lose my job and I really wanted to make sure people understood that the, I was being motivated by the risk and just wanting a solution, wanting an overarching solution to our technical security risk management woes. And from that, I tried to make very clear the technology officer would no longer have any hidden risk, he would no longer have a hot potato in his lap, and it could be really beneficial if shit terms of security was already solved before it arrived on his desk. And he agreed. <laughs> so again, awareness is your, if you do this, the, the, the best way to do it is, is become an irresistible force. You need to, to, awareness is key, look for opportunities, and basically, I realize I'm describing the 24-7 ODA loop. Enumerate your and maximize all your personal comms channels and keep the feedback coming in. I got involved with Works Council. I had friends, I had legal friends that were from the legal team that were helping me with this. I even went to the CEO and even got his support for this. 
but I did it one by one, very slowly, very patiently, and when somebody told me, you're making too much of a noise, I would back off and wait. And eventually, persistence and determination is what saw it through. I could not have done this without my connections across the company, my personal connections, people who believe me to be honest, people who believe me as being true and putting other people's priorities ahead of my own. And that was only possible because I had already for 15 years been working that way. Last one. I should have done better on this. I involved my wife every day as much as I could, but it still wasn't enough. I could have done better. Don't leave your family in the dark. Lateralize and asymmetrize, as I mentioned before. This is how I literally went across. I even went to everybody but the CFO in the second case because I did not want it to be seen as a political move. So the whole time the CFO was going, what is he doing? The CEO knew. CTO knew he didn't like it. <laughs> the marketing directors knew. The commercial directors knew. The HR director knew. I was getting support from every direction except one. By the, but it did... By the way, that support didn't all come at once. It took about 12 months to get it all. Corporate silos don't help the cause, but they can be used tactically if you're going to do this, but use them ethically. Don't lie. Don't deceive. And be a little creative. Hope for the best, plan for the worst. And yes, this was, this was my personal strategy. When I, when I looked at this, I made a very personal, this is something I really believe in. I think that there are too many, I'm not trying to, to, to point the finger, but I think there's, let me, let me rephrase this. I think we as security professionals really need to take a better understanding of how we are embodying, embodying the principles we are asking our employers to implement and not doing it ourselves in regards to risk management. I sort of have a reputation of being someone who's typically always prepared, and that's because I'm always thinking down the road and thinking, what am I going to need when I get there? What are the risks going to be? How can I manage those risks? Somebody, once in a while, somebody says, I'm overly paranoid. No, I'm just managing risk. And I'm very keenly aware of the risk exposure, typically. Not always, but I try to be. I work really hard at that. So I, I came up with the strategy not to throw myself underneath the bus, but I did loosely refer to it as that. And I, my real strategy was to throw my team across the company to the proper place and not get hit by the bus. But in every scenario I calculated, and there were at least 12 different scenarios, Every scenario include, what do I do if I get hit by the bus? I can't stop the consequences, but I can manage them. And that's what I did. I had an assurance of protection from the top, but still, I chose not to completely bank on that. I don't know how long that political pressures might cause that to succumb. I thought some people said, not from where that's coming from, but I didn't want to take that risk. I thought, let's manage that. And I pretty much unleashed my potential at this point and did some pretty crazy things in the company, but all very constructive. Um, this one was very interesting. About six months into the second company, all sorts of new opportunities started coming available. I was put forward by the HR director and the CEO to the leadership council for the company. I was actually asked to participate in talks about the upcoming reorganization of the company. I was asked quite for quite a lot of feedback about the company, not just security, but about the company's health. I was eventually recruited to actually get on board with helping change the company culture by the CEO and the HR director, which I took up. I thought, yeah, great opportunity. This is something we can just ride this across now. Although I, I, I picked this up, and I started all of this alone, it wasn't very long before I had a lot of help. And I would not have been able to do it without that help. Yeah? Yep, okay, so let's move on. So basically the summary, if you are a CIO 
CISO, CXO, um, don't panic. If, if you are looking at, at this and going, I didn't know I had any of this liability. This, is, this actually happens. The, um, the best thing to do is come forward and recognize it, be honest about it. In the first case, when we took it to the CFO and the CTO of the company, um, within one to two hours, the discussion was finished. And six weeks later, we were transferred across over to finance. And they actually located our offices right on the demarcation point of technology and finance to ease our, our process. So timing was key. Uh, the opportunity also helped with the, the weight of that. Um, yeah, as I said, it was done in two hours. We were located in six hours. After this, everything changed in the company. We no longer had to be going back and patch. And it, not, it wasn't immediate, but within a year. We weren't going back and patching things anymore after they were launched. When we were invited to the conceptualization and the investment committees and all these different boards and everything, as a member of finance, they started looking at us and going, hey, does making a, a web-based game and giving away call times on who wins this, does that make sense? So we looked at the CEO and said, it sounds nice, but people can hack web games so easy. And he was like, well, okay, well, we'll just scratch that one then. Let's find something else to do. If that project had hit us six weeks later in, in, in technology, we would have been screwed. Everything became easy like this. And we also got called in to, to, to um, yeah, sorry, I got a little bit high because I'm, I'm trying to speed on through. But the benefits were, were immense. And in that, this is when our vendors came back a couple of years later and said, your network is freaking so quiet. And we didn't even believe them at first. And it turns out it actually it had actually gone that way. And since then, I've talked to him since, and he says he's never seen a company that quiet again. He's seen government agencies that quiet, but not any private companies. So I want to fix our industry. And I th how can we do this? If you're holding on to it, don't panic. Come forward, offer your help to anybody who's raised this to you, make it a discussion point, just table it. Even if you think it's not happening, discuss it. Bring it out into the open. Bring like an infection, let's get it out there. If you're a grunt and you're subject to this, don't panic. But there is also another choice, don't do anything or leave. Those are options and they're valid ones and there's, there's nothing wrong with them. If you leave, you're at least not part of the problem anymore. But uh, maybe you have family illness. Maybe you had too many kids. You planned on two and had six. And now you can't take that financial risk. Then don't. But understand, you will have some risk exposure by being caught in this conflicted job or role in your professional career. So you have to decide that on yourself. And if you do do it, yes, if you do decide to do this, please share your results with me because I think the community could really benefit from this. Benefit as an industry to change the place where we do technology security risk management. So basically, conflicting financial incentives have to be aligned. Security professionals should never be making the choices themselves. And they, some security professionals really may, in order to solve this problem, have to decide to take on some of the risk themselves to get to a better place. But the best solution for this is one that comes from business management themselves. And the final thought, and then I'll be done, if you're really stuck or determined to continue managing the wholesale risk, corporate risk from an outside fundamental financial risk-based approach, and you're going to continue with the technological-centric view of risk and continue this arms race, I'll leave you with this final thought. The arms race you are playing is a strange game. The only winning move is not to play. Thank you. Thank you. Was it good? <laughs>